University Centre Hells Own event. Uh, my name is Jamie Morgan Green. I'm the community manager here at Hells End College. Uh, the University Centre opened uh, last January, so uh, just uh, just a year ago, and it's in partnership with the University of Worcester. Um, and we'll, we'll be putting on um, free lectures each month around different topics. Um, we hope the lectures will inspire you and um, possibly make you consider um, going into higher education. Our lecture today is by Dr. Roshan Doug on creativity and well-being in the curriculum. We'll hand over to Roshan shortly, but first some housekeeping for the event today. Hopefully, as you joined, you'll notice that your cameras and microphones are switched off. Uh, please continue to be muted throughout the lecture so we don't have any background noise that could interfere. If you do have any questions for Roshan, we encourage you to use the chat box and we will do a short Q&A at the end of the session. At the bottom right of your screen, you should see a purple tab with arrows. Uh, and once you click this, you will see the chat window and the chat will be monitored throughout the lecture. Uh, so without further ado, I will hand over to Dr. Roshan Doug. Roshan, you can unmute yourself and your video now. Uh, in, in education. There must be a number of people who are watching this who have probably got a lot more expertise in the politics and the nature of education and the model that we have got today. So I am not in any way uh, trying to suggest that I have all the answers uh, or that I am in any way an, an, an expert. I am not. I am an enthusiast. I am passionate about the state of education today and the way it is monitored, the way it has become a political football and the way in which the pupil has become a kind of an entity which um, which is kind of disturbing and concerning for people like myself who are involved in teaching um, and what i'm hoping to do uh, today this um, this evening is to uh, take you on a journey um, I want to talk about creativity and I want to talk about well-being, but I don't want to use these words the way that politicians and policymakers have been using them. And that is just to uh, score goals. I'm not interested in that. Um, I'm going to really give you an idea of, um, of who I am and why I'm actually here this evening. Um, I started teaching uh, back in 1985 and I came into teaching because I was inspired and I want to use that word and I'm going to sort of underline it. I was inspired by some of the teachers who taught me um, and I thought, you know, I would like 
this to be my life not a job but and not even a career but it was going to be a central aspect of, of my life the way i saw the world the way i saw people the way i saw organizations the way i saw politicians and the government education for me and teaching for me has opened a number of doors and given me so many perspectives about the way we live and having gone through the whole process of education getting O levels and a levels and so forth i have sort of come to the conclusion that much of what we are doing in education at this very moment is questionable um, and i'm going to take you on a journey to try and illustrate what i mean by that uh, the purpose of, of, of this, uh, this lecture is, to, uh, is for me to argue that the existing model of education that we've got, which is a national curriculum that started in 1988 under the, the Conservative government, uh, and the way it developed in the 90s, is something that we might want to look at critically and ask ourselves questions about who does it serve? Does it serve the state? Does it serve the pupil? Or does it serve the economy? And I'm going to really sort of try and pose some questions which uh, might make you think. And I think they'll be particularly useful if you are involved um, in the study of education, if you are a student of education. Um, and I also want to really ask, where does the child fit in this whole national project that started in the, in the late 19th century? Um, and how much do we really care about the pupil? And I'm going to also uh, finally suggest some ways that we can actually improve this um, uh, existing model of education, which really is the model that many countries throughout the world are using. Um, I'm going to begin uh, my little talk by referring to the context in which education as a formal discipline started in the, um, the late 19th century. Um, and many of you, of course, know that um, uh, in the late 19th century, we had the start or the development of the Industrial uh, Revolution. Um, there was urbanization, and really the economy was all about using people to create wealth. Um, my father, who came over uh, from India in the, in the 1950s, uh, worked in um, some of the foundries that were reminiscent of the the late 19th century. We lived in a house uh, which was very much like this, built and designed purely for the purpose of creating um, a wealthy nation. Um, and everyone who I knew lived in a terraced house. And we lived in Hansworth, which is not too far from where I'm, I live at the moment. And um, many of the houses there were terraced houses. And in fact, uh, we lived on Factory Road. And uh, Factory Road was where the first, the first factory was built, the Soho Manufacturing Factory by Matthew Bolton. And we lived in a terraced house. And everyone in that terraced house went to work at the same time. And they worked 
in foundries. My father worked in a foundry from about six o'clock in the morning till about um, seven, eight in the evening. Um, and the whole purpose of that was to create money. It was all about money. Uh, there was very little, you know, individuality. Uh, for my father, uh, who worked from about, um, you know, once it, since he was about 16 or so, that's all he did. He worked in a foundry from uh, from six in the morning till about um, uh, eight in the evening. That was from Monday to Friday and sometimes on a Saturday as well. And he did that for 30 odd years. Um, he would clock on, he'd leave. And a lot of people were familiar with this system of clocking on, clocking. You were just treated essentially um, as, a, as a kind of a robotic body. Um, you weren't really a human being, you were a number. And we haven't really moved that way, that far from that particular model of using people to create uh, a better, wealthier economy. I might argue that today we've got the same system being applied in, in education. This is a video that I'm going to show. And this is the, the oh, can't open it. Lottie, would you be kind enough to put the video on for me, please, if it works? And if it doesn't, we'll have to leave it out. I'll give it a go. Hold on. Yeah, I got it. <clears throat> it's a very short video, but it just shows the the hardship that people actually encountered uh, in the in the Victorian period, and even up until the um, you know 1970s. I'm not sure whether it's working or not. Is it is it playing? There's no sound to this. Um, No. And this particular factory or, or a foundry uh, was at the back of the Hawthorns football ground and it was called the Dartmouth um, Auto Casting Foundry. And uh, this is what my father was doing for about 12 hours a day. Uh, it was very, very hard work. It was, you know, it was harsh environment uh, and it was a dangerous environment, you know, um, making um, iron and uh, tools for, for, the, for the economy, you know, so you were actually sort of sending all this out through, throughout um, various parts of the world. And um, this carried on up until about 1979, but look at the hellish demoralizing setting that um, you know people of my father's generation actually had to endure um, and I, when you sort of came out there was very little in the way of creativity and and um, and um, you know the freedom to 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 think the way you wanted to think what you were doing was just working and you were just making money that's that was the essence of your uh, whole time on earth to live to create wealth for your family and um, and and for the economy and this is that was what you had to endure now i've mentioned that not because i'm trying to create uh, a pitiful image of my uh, humble background i'm not doing that at all what i'm trying to do is to make a link between that kind of approach to living and what we are doing in schools today. I might argue that the system that we've got from the 19th century using people to create a better economy is the kind of system that sort of lends itself to the education as a project. Uh, in the late 19th century, education arose out of this idea that we were going to create people uh, who were going to advance the country. 
And today, I don't think we actually think much about pupils. We think more about their value. What are they going to bring to the economy? I don't know whether you can still see me. Yep, thank you very much, Lottie. Um, Charles Dickens, <clears throat> in, um, in Hard Times, actually describes this atmosphere um, where everything is uniform, everything is standardized, and everything looks more or less the same. In his um, description of Coke Town, in his novel Hard Time, he describes the town as a town of red brick, or a brick that would have been red um, if the smoke and ashes had allowed it. But as matters stood, it was a town of unnatural red and black, like the painted face of a savage. It was a town of machinery and tall chimneys out of which interminable serpents of smoke trailed themselves forever and ever and never got uncoiled. It had a black canal and a river that ran purple with ill-smelling dye and vast piles of building full of windows where there was a rattling and a trembling all day long and where the piston of the steam engine worked monotonously up and down like the head of an elephant in a state of melancholy madness. It contained several large streets, all very like one another and many small streets, still more like one another, inhabited by people equally like one another, who all went in and out at the same hours, with the same sound upon the same pavement, to do the same work, and to whom every day was the same as yesterday and tomorrow, and every year the counterpart of the last and the next. I wonder whether you can recognize what we are doing in schools there. Um, is the activity that we've got in schools more or less the same as that? Where we are going to school, we're getting kids to log on at about um, you know, nine o'clock and they leave at about half three and they all have the same education, whether they're from Scotland, north of Scotland, or from Cornwall. They have the same um, number of hours. Um, they've got the same kind of teachers. They've got the same approaches to teaching and learning. Um, and where everything is monitored, uh, everything is unitized in terms of knowledge, um, and all the assessments are standardized and every pupil is expected to have certain kinds of lo uh, knowledge uh, when they get to six, when they get to eight, when they get to 11. Um, I wonder, you know, whether that kind of education, which is what we are trying get, to get all our children to go through, whether that actually benefits the individual or are they just all being used as a collective group without any sense of individuality. I think our existing model of education um, is very, very uh, questionable. Uh, and I'm not sure whether the pupil is uh, in any way happy or happier than they would be if they weren't part of that model. Um, there is a lot of uniformity, a lot of standardization, a lot of focus on assessment, a lot of regulation and inspection. There's a lot of activity going on in schools, but the last entity that we really think about is the, the child. Um, and I know we've got, um, you know, assessments taking place constantly uh, over and over again. We are assessing children. And today we have got a generation that have had more assessments and testing than any generation before them. 
but are they, and you've got to ask this question, are they any more happier than our generation and previous generations before us? And if they are not, then does the system that we have designed fit the purpose? Is it fit for the purpose it was designed? And in the 19th century, it was designed to make the individual richer. The child could learn to read and write, and by doing so, they would have a peer life. That was the thinking. But even in the 19th century, there was a fight going on between the state. The state wanted control over that kind of uh, project. And the church, the church also wanted to control the sense of morality, values and so forth that a Christian nation should have. And the third component was the, 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 the parents. And I might argue that the parents' role has actually diminished to such an extent I think the state has a lot more control over your child, not only when they are born, um, and even before that, you know, I think the state is controlling in terms of where you're going to live, how much money you've got, uh, how much money you owe banks and banking system. And that's going to determine the kind of family you're going to have and where you're going to live. And when your child is born straight away, they are taken away and um, they're injected. They're given a number. They've got a, a national insurance number of some kind. They've got to be registered. They've got to have certain inoculations. All of that is taking place. And they have to go to school by the time about the about four or five. All that has got to be done. And if you don't do that, you are going to be punished for it. You'll be fined. You'll be penalized. Um, and you can't take your child out of um, schooling. And if you do, then again, you will be punished. Your child is not your child. And I think the more we think about the way which schooling, the way schooling works, um, giving you the giving the child homework every night, a child is having homework, despite the fact that the child has been in school for about seven hours, six, seven hours, they come back, and when they're supposed to spend some time with their parents, they're given some extra work that they've got to complete in the evening. The child's time and connection are kind of questionable. When does the child have time for his parents? And when does the parent, when does a parent uh, have the right to question the kind of activity and knowledge and learning that child is exposed to? Um, and I think this, this also sort of comes back to the idea that there is a lot of concern amongst the parents that they are losing um, control over their own offsprings because the state, through the teaching, through the teachers and schooling, the state is controlling every aspect of a child's life up until they are 16, 17, 18. And even then we are now forcing, or oh, well, not forcing is the wrong word, but we are compelling them to go into university. Our government has said that in another so 20 years or so, everyone, 50% of uh, the population has got to have some kind of a university education. And many teachers might argue, you know, what is the, the value of that education um, and who is it going to serve? Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure whether that, that constant buzz of activity that we've got in schools is really beneficial. I'm not really sure how beneficial that is. Maybe it is beneficial to some extent because the child can read and write and so forth. 
but I wonder will it be other stuff that we have to we, we're teaching and the child is being exposed to is really to their to, to their benefit um, so there's a lot of regulation going on in schools you know this because you're all interested in education and you are connected with it in, in some ways um, but there's a lot of regulation going on uh, and the the child's whole school day is regulated to such extent that um, there is very little time for non activity and I'm going to come back to the the importance of not doing anything because I think that is just as valuable as our focus on activity and action and doing something physical or whether it's mental um, let me just just go on to a, a couple more slides um, because I think the, the child is, is suffering in the model that we've got. There is a great deal of disaffection um, going on. Children, if you ask any child at the age of about 11, uh, up until they're about 16, 17, um, whether what they are doing in school is actually useful. A high number of children are saying they don't really link with the knowledge, with the teaching, with the learning that's taking place in school. They don't really see the relevance. Hence, there's so many children today who are playing truant. Um, truancy rate is actually pretty high. We are talking somewhere in the region of about 13, 14 percent of um, children who miss schools. Um, and that's an, thousands of hours um, a week that are being missed by, by children. A report that was done uh, only a while ago um, estimated that 20% um, of our uh, school leavers are functionally illiterate. Despite the fact that there's been so much money spent on um, on education, new strategies, new approaches, every child matters, which is a kind of a strange oxymoron because at the end of the day, in that um, model, the child doesn't matter. It's just the policy that matters, not the, the child. It's the policy. Where do we keep that policy? Do we put every child matters in our lesson plans? The child is the least important thing within that context. And 20% of our school leavers are functionally illiterate. I'm not saying they're completely illiterate. They're functionally illiterate. That means they can't function in a world where there is text that they have to read or they have to do some very basic maths. They can't function. They can't function at the age of, a, of about 10 year old. 20%. Now, just to let you say there's about sort of 600, 700,000 school leavers every year. And 20%, over 100,000 are unable to read and write properly. We fail them because they're not connected. They don't really see the purpose in, in education. Um, recently, I think in 2017, um, the, the BBC did a survey and they found that um, uh, although there's about 4.5% uh, of um, primary school children who don't go to school, miss schools for you know long, persistent periods of time, um, there's about sort of 11 percent at least in secondary schools who don't go to that you know that that's that's at least sort of one in um one in ten who are not going to school they don't see any connection with what they are learning and their own life how does it better them they don't see any point i i have been teaching uh, functional skills children um, they're very, very intelligent. They can argue pretty well with me, but they just didn't get on at school. And when I asked them, why didn't you do very well in school? Don't see the point. Didn't want to go to school. 
So we're failing schools. Schools are failing because children don't see any relevance. And there are other, of course, um, barriers to learning. Um, the, the whole structure, the way that the, 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 the curriculum is organized, that everyone's got to do the same kind of stuff and learn the same knowledge um, doesn't suit everyone. We are applying the Victorian model to the 21st century and we can't because what is absent within that model is creativity, originality, individuality. We are still, I know we talk about differentiation, but differentiation is just a nice buzzword. It doesn't really mean anything because to, to, to have a, a system that is designed for the child, you have to do some radical thinking. And the radical thinking that we have to do is to say, well, you know, let's be absolutely critical. Let's be absolutely honest and say, am I happy doing this job as a teacher? Could I do this job better? I think many teachers would say, yes, we could. The only problem is that politicians have a stranglehold of this um, education as a project. And because they've got so much money invested in it, they've appointed so many people to govern this project. Not only principals, head teachers and so forth, but Ofsted, Ofqual, gotten so many bodies are actually involved ensuring that it actually remains as it is, unchanged. Yes, we tamper with it a little bit here and there. Politicians will come in for about five years or so, make a mark, Michael Gold being one of them. They'll make a mark and then they move on. But no one within that really cares about the child. Um, we've got children now who are suffering from ADHD, uh, stress, anxiety. We've got mental health problems. And all of that is really very hard. If you, if you look at some of the reports, it's very, very high indeed. And depression and self-harm and bullying. School does not help. Excuse me. School does not help. School, I think, is actually one of the causes of children's ill health. And of course, that's, I've mentioned irrelevancy of, of, of some of the, the learning that's taking place. Um, but there's also um, parents who feel that they've got no confidence in the, the system. And they're becoming distrustful of teachers and uh, policy makers because the last uh, entity that we care about is the parents. Parents are removed. Every now and then we will have a parents' evening. But um, really, the parents are not involved in the, the curriculum. They're not involved in the extra uh, curricular activities. Um, we don't actually involve the community. In fact, many of the schools now have got gates and they're locked from about nine till um, you know three thirty. Uh, is that to keep the the child away from the the outside world or the outside world from the school? Um, so I'm I'm just just wondering, you know, what 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 we could do to make that system slightly better so that it works uh, to the advantage of the, of the, of the child. Um, so there's a lot of lack of control that's going on uh, amongst um, in the, the dynamics between the pupil and the, and the, and the parent. Um, Haiti students also feel the same way. And a report was done by um, the Insight Network and they, they found that um, out of the 37,000 uh, students that they, they interviewed from about 140 universities, one in five students has currently a mental health problem diagnosed clinically having 
a mental health problem. One in five. Uh, and one in three has experienced a serious psychological issue. Uh, I'm not saying there is a link between that and schooling, but schooling doesn't actually help at all. Um, and that, I think, should concern us as educationalists. We should be thinking about how we can function so that we don't just function as people who are going to get a salary at the end of the month, but people who actually got a genuine interest in the work that we're doing and its impact on the, on the child. What I discovered in the last um, you know, couple of years, because I'm writing a paper, um, is that the, the national curriculum as a project which says one size fits all, fails boys, particularly. Um, girls do really well in the early part of the secondary schooling, um, but um, particularly working class boys, they don't connect with it. They don't see any kind of relevance between what they're doing at school and their lives. Education is seen largely as an irrelevant entity, hence the truancy rate. And many students, pupils, are scared to go to school because, you know, because of um, bullying, because they're asked to compete, because they're constantly measured in terms of their performance. Just imagine going to work and every day you're asked, um, you know, why aren't you working hard? You're going to get a B grade. You're going to get a C grade. You're going to get an E grade. You know, we want you to do better than that. Look at your, your friends. Look how well they're doing. And every day you are being measured. And every day you're made to feel that you're not good enough. And I think we need to ask ourselves some questions about the value of what we are doing. Um, homework is, is another area, and I've written a paper about this. Um, apparently, homework benefits the primary school children when they are learning some basic arithmetic uh, and, and, and handwriting and holding a pen and so forth. After that, it is questionable whether the homework that they get from the age of about eight, nine uh, to about um, 14, 15 is actually beneficial to them. And uh, all that their benefit is perhaps isn't as high as their detrimental effect. And homework is particularly useful when a child gets to 15, 16, when they're revising and so forth. But during that middle period, homework has very minimal effect on a child's learning. And yet we, can, we carry on pushing this idea that homework is important. And every school will talk about their homework policy. What we should be doing is asking schools, and this is really me talking as opposed to looking at the reports. But what we should be doing is asking schools to publicize their truancy rate. How many of their children are actually missing schools every year? That's what I would like to know. How many hours have children missed last year, the year before and so forth? because that might indicate whether the children are actually engaged with their learning. And I think that would be really beneficial. But of course, very few schools and colleges talk about their truancy rate. Government and policy management uh, need to put less emphasis on grades and attainment and look at curricular, yeah, extracurricular activities. Um, in, um, in schools, they are expected to do some sports activities. They might be asked to do some music, but they're not forced to. 
And I think that it would be a, a good way of actually developing well-being where children are expressing themselves, um, not because they're going to be assessed, not for assessment, just for the fun of it. Just when was the last time you did something and you said um, to your line manager, we're doing it just for the fun of it, just for the fun of it. There's no assessment, there's no uh, exam, there's no mock exam or anything like that, but we're doing it for the fun of it. You know, I think if you tried that, your line manager would question you and say, hmm, can't do it for the fun of it. It's got to have some kind of intrinsic value. We've got to be able to measure it. We've got to put it into a spreadsheet. Um, Education management need to treat education, uh, need to perhaps uh, not treat education as, uh, as a business. Uh, at the moment, this is what it is. We've got so many managers. You know, at one time we used to have a head teacher, and then you had um, subject heads, and then you had teachers. Now we've got so many layers of management that you might wonder whether you are actually in a corporation uh, or in a school or in a college um, and there's too much focus on social policy that's another thing which is um, again this is my concern not uh, concern of other critics uh, a lot of social policy a lot of identity politics going on in, in, in education a lot of multicultural uh, stuff going on prevent is going on feminism climate change anti-racism black lives matter all of that is i think we're just pushing a government agenda What's that got to do with learning? And you might ask, you know, say, well, we've got to learn about the world that we're living in. But we are presenting one particular ideology, one particular political ideology. And conservatism is just as important. Heritage is just as important. You know, um, history is just as important. And all of that, I think, maybe, you know, gets... Uh, marginalized a great deal, um, set against, I think, sort of um, lots of identity politics and, um, and and stuff about climate change. And, you know, we get we get lost. And is it surprising that many of our pupils are also feeling a little bit confused amongst this mass of um, policies and approaches? Um, and finally, I think what we've lost there is, this is me being a, a real conservative and a traditionalist, but I think we're losing the moral compass. Back in India, you know, um, we had this um, Gurukul uh, education system before the British um, uh, came over to India and before uh, the Arabs came to, to India. There was a, a traditional ancient Hindu uh, system which is that you went to a guru and you became his disciple not in that sort of spiritual sense but somebody who wanted to learn you were a student of his and you would learn you know about astrology astronomy uh, you would learn about faith you'd learn about spirituality you would talk about you know and science art and meditation and yoga sports you would learn all of that with the guru and you would sit in silence you wouldn't do anything and you wouldn't talk just imagine doing that in our schools where we get children just to sit in silence for a while yeah you'd be, be criticized so much but this is ha happening in parts of asia you know, if you go to uh, China, if you go to parts of um, India, um, Pakistan, there are schools where they will actually ask children to sit in silence for a while because you've got to control the way you're thinking. And sometimes you have to sit in silence to, you know, in order to achieve fulfillment and satisfaction. And it's not all about activity. I've got to sort of move on a little bit because I'm, I'm, I'm conscious that we're sort of um, running out of time. So these are my findings very, very briefly. Um, 
which is uh, based on some studies I have done, uh, people who are genuinely clever are also uh, very creative. I am one of those people who've got these degrees. I don't consider myself clever at all. I'm not clever. I'm not intelligent. Uh, I've met people who don't have a single low level and they can argue with me and they can beat me in an argument <laughs> um, because they're clever. My father wasn't an educated man, but he was clever. He had common sense. We don't teach common sense. Creative management, and this is, I think management need to be creative. Yeah, but instead of just focusing on data, data collection, moving data from one platform to another, um, you know, manufacturing data, um, replicating data, sending data, sharing data. Instead of doing all that, let's talk about practice. What are they doing? And I would say this to any senior management, a manager, what are you doing to enrich the lives of our pupils? Uh, once this, this, this um, wonderful uh, academic said to me when I first started teaching, he said, Rush, it's very easy uh, to get lost in the system. Always remember that whatever you do has got to benefit the pupil. If it doesn't benefit the pupil, probably not that important. And I think I've, I agree with that. And I still apply that principle today. <laughs> um, if it doesn't benefit my students, I think, what's, what's the point? Students will say to me, Drush, do you want me to you know, do this work? And I said, well, I don't think it's important for you. You don't need to do that. Leave it. Other students might say, do I have to do this for homework? No, you don't have to do that. Uh, I, in fact, I say to students, go and spend some time with your parents. Learn from your parents. Sit in silence for a while. Listen to music. You know, we have to try and help children to be happy. And the other thing that's happened is that there's been a decline in teachers' autonomy. Teachers are not regarded as gurus. Teachers are now regarded as people who are a kind of pain in the bottom. They don't have the same autonomy that they used to. They were used to be in charge of a class. They would go into a class and they would do what they thought their children needed. Uh, my girlfriend, you know, she, she trained as a teacher only a while ago. She thought she'd go in and, you know, she would be able to inspire the, the children. She was really enthused with the, uh, with the idea of, you know, going in and inspiring children. Within a year, she, she was so disheartened. She said, I can't do anything without doing some paperwork here and talking about outcomes and talking about methodology and um, looking at descriptors. And that's what we have done to ourselves. And really what, we've, we've, what we need to do is to assert the teacher uh, as the, the important figure uh, in this relationship between the child and education. And we need to bring in um, the local community. We need to bring in people from the community to, to be part of the school's life, not just as parent governors. That's, that's pointless. You know, parent governors will come in for a while and they go out, but, but really be part of the student's life. And now we, we, don't, we don't do that. Um, Education has become a quality assurance exercise with absurd obsession with data assessments where the pupil is lost in the system. And that's, you know, goes without me sort of saying anything because that, that, that's clearly there. Too much reliance on the state to provide well-being. And well-being is something that we should teach. I think we should teach children to be happy. I did a lesson on what is happiness uh, with my functional skills students and they were saying, well, Never had a lesson like this, you know, no one talks about being happy. But I think we should. We should try and teach kids to have self-respect. I think we should try and teach children to, um, you know, find the right partner, to find the right job. I think we should teach all that. 
and that shouldn't be just um, something that they they pick up as they get older this should be part of the curriculum um, and finally there's too much um, emphasis on mediocrity um, we don't teach kids to be uh, geniuses we can teach them to be average mediocre um, because to be a genius to be outstanding you have to be outside that system and many of us are unfortunately slaves to the system um, I would like really as a final solution and let Ofsted go I would like to challenge Ofsted Ofsted started off as a as a uh, as a body that was there to help teachers it was it was a it was guiding us sharing good practice now it's a dictatorial body and whenever people say you know there's going to be a Ofsted inspection you know people panic you know Ofsted inspection oh my god and how did that happen how did it happen how did we as educationists let that happen and need for education management to exercise creative thinking you know um, we had the um, recently we had um, the the coronavirus and when the coronavirus happened you know all managers in all colleges started asking teachers what should we do now well that's your job that's why you were appointed as managers you are not there just to you know collect data and share spreadsheets you're there to be creative that's what you get you know that's why you get a salary um, but unfortunately we don't look at that we, we're not looking for creative managers we're just looking for people who are very good administrators uh, and we should change our way of thinking in relation to management uh, and extracurricular activities but without the formal assessments like sports and expressive arts or cooking or painting should be part of the curriculum that should be core aspect of the curriculum. When I wake up in the morning, I mean, I think a lot of people do, they want to sing. Well, maybe not early in the morning, but you know, during the daytime, you want to sing. You feel good when you're singing. You feel good when you're dancing. We should, we should want to do that. And that should be part of the curriculum. We should encourage children to dance freely. They should feel good about where they are and we need to decolonize the curriculum this is a phrase that i borrowed from a friend of mine and uh, and it really means look at the, the world from a you know away from that narrow perspective look at it from a wider perspective from different angles and we should stop teaching the same old stuff over and over again because really it doesn't have that much of a an impact now, um, and silence, reflection, meditation, yoga should have a centrality. I really, really believe this. There are a number of schools that I've visited in India who, uh, when you talk to the children, they actually do yoga and meditation, silence. And they feel good about it. Now, obviously, I haven't done any empirical studies on this, where there is a direct correlation between, you know, sitting in silence and meditating and, 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 and doing yoga and happiness. But I think there might be a link. And people who are in education and want to do some more studies, perhaps that might be an area worth um, exploring. And I would like to teach social ethics. You know, children come in with brilliant, you know, creative minds. They want to do things. They want to make things. They want to question why are the stars twinkling? How far is the moon and all that kind of stuff? How does a flower grow and become so beautiful? How does a seed become a tree? And then we destroy all that wonder, all that imagination goes out. And by the time they're 16, they're so cynical, just like us. Yeah, and I would like children to explore issues of philosophy, issues relating to right and wrong. And for that reason, I love to teach social ethics. I think that should be part 
of the, the curriculum as well. And finally, this is my last bit. I promise I won't um, talk anymore after this. Um, systems should improve the human condition and the national curriculum, the way it is meted out, the way it is governed, the way it functions really benefit um, the state, not the individual. We are not here for the pupil. We're here for the system. This, we have become slave to the system. We've become slaves to the national project, the national curriculum. Can we, as education, take more control over this project, this education system? Is it influenced too much by social policy and ideology? Personally, I think it is. And every child matters. I don't know. I'm not sure whether every child has ever mattered. Really. Every child has always been in this political football ground. And can we teach children to be happy? Can we help them to find their niche? I, ladies and gentlemen, think we can. But it really starts with us as professionals who know why we are here. We're not here just for the money. Of course, money is important. I'm, I'm aware of that salary is important, but we must be there because it's a calling. And we've got to feel passionate about the work we are doing. And if we're not inspired, and if we're feeling really demoralized when we go to work on a Monday morning and it's all cold, how are our pupils going to be inspired? Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you very much for giving me your time. I really appreciate it. And I know that I was going to say a lot more, but, um, you know, um, time is of the essence, and I'm afraid we've run out. So thank you very much. And I'm, I'm, I'm quite happy to take one or two questions. Um, so, uh, Lottie, shall I leave that with you? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll aspects here right? thank you so much um just a really interesting fascinating um lecture the, the, thank you Tom. you're welcome there's a, a, a there's been a question from uh jason uh who says um isaac asimov believed giving autonomy to the student through technology would relieve them of the sense of dread that students feel do you think increased autonomy would lead to higher engagement and the pursuit of their own goals rather than those impressing mm -hmm. on them. The, the, the use of IT, I mean, it's a sort of double-edged sword. On the one hand, yes, it's actually allowing you know, children and, and students to engage with the wider communities and, um, and use a, a range of skills that um, they exercise when they're at home, you know, playing on the computer and so forth. Um, but at the same time, you know, social media has also um, dis detached us from society. And uh, what I would like is for people to use that technology as a way of connecting with people in real life, not as, 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 as um, I don't know, things in computer games where they can actually take on uh, bodies and entities and be something else. But I think in a way, um, I would like to see more people engaging with one another uh, face to face, <laughs> I say this, which is ironic, because I'm actually talking to you um, through this 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 lens. Um, but yeah, Jason, I I really do believe personally that you know we 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 should have um, people using their skills, IT skills, uh, not as a way of distancing themselves from the world, but connecting themselves. I, um, we've um, uh, Paul, uh, Paul Bridgewater, um, sort of posed a, you know, posed a number of comments and, and sort of questions. Um, so I'll just go through those because I think I'm, I'm sure you might kind of want to comment on some of those. Uh, the first thing he said was the teaching unions have pressed institutions to reward teachers. Sorry, I, I didn't catch that, Jamie. Sorry, what was that? I'll start again. The teaching unions have 
pressed institutions to reward teachers through salary levels and the need for responsibility posts. And this has resulted in the multi-level management positions. He also, uh, he also goes on to say that he, he agrees that managers should be more creative, um, but creativity is not rated as an attribute of a good manager and is not taken into account when making appointments. Instead, the attributes used to determine a good manager are things such as numeracy, uh, logical skills, data analysis, and he even sort of says, maybe when we have um, you know, or when we interview for a management post, we can see how creative the candidate is as a teacher. Absolutely, I would agree with that, Paul. Um, you know, I think my 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 concern uh, is that in in management, I did apply for a management position. You know, sort of a. Uh, principal, assistant principal, some time ago, and uh, I remember the, um, the 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 actual feedback was that you know you you you're you're okay as somebody who's going to talk broadly about issues relating to education and so forth, but uh, really management is about the nitty gritty, about the daily grime, about figures and statistics, you know. And I thought, oh. <laughs> My heart sang because you know you think well I want managers to be leaders I want them to be inspirational I want them to you know inspire me and make me an even better teacher that I feel good about myself. Um, I mean I just might ask that 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 question to to everyone there. You know, when was the last time your manager really inspired you? <clears throat> that's that's that that's a very interesting question we haven't had any responses yet perhaps people are thinking trying to think of the, think of the last time that they were perhaps inspired um we've also asked the audience if there was any more questions and no, we haven't had any come through um okay. yet but obviously you know um we are recording this session, so it might even be that um, some questions are posed outside of outside of this, but kind of um, sort of separately. Um, I'm I'm happy to conclude if you are. No, that's that's fine. I'd just like to say thank you very much to you, Jamie. Uh, thank you to Lottie for for organising this, and uh, thank you very much to Henry for helping us out earlier on this afternoon. Uh, I really do appreciate that. Thank you very much to Hellzone College for allowing me this platform. And uh, as I said, you know, my, my views are just my views. They're not uh, the views of any establishments that I'm actually associated with. Um, and, you know, I suppose I got to, I've got to an age now where I feel that um, there's all kinds of ideas in my head and I want to try and share that with people and you know people will disagree with many of the things I've actually said but that's 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 good that's how we develop you know discourse and that's how we develop ideas relating to our profession so thank you very much to everyone for giving me your time and um, hope to hear from you guys soon um, so with 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 that, um, we hope that everybody has enjoyed today's session. Um, as I said, um, it has been uh, recorded, so it will be available, and Lottie will be able to send details um, to everybody about the um, about where you can access the recording. Um, if you would like further information about the University Centre Halesian or studying higher education at Halesian College and the University of Worcester. Uh, you can contact our community hub assistant, uh, <coughs> who is Lottie Summers, and she um, is available at lsummers at uk. You will receive um, an email soon asking for feedback on today's session, and if you would like to be added to our mailing list, um, you can include your details at the end of the survey. Our next lecture. Um, is on Thursday, the 25th of February, and we'll discuss social media and body image.
Um, and you can book tickets for that now. Um, more information is available at uh, www.halesowin.ac.uk. If you then go to facilities and the University Centre Hales Owen, all of the details are on there with our book. Um, other than that, if you would like to leave the session, you can use the menu at the top left of your screen. Um, and leave session is at the bottom of that menu. Um, thank you ever so much again for everybody who um, has, uh, has joined us today. And we hope to see you all very soon.